France with uh, so Laurent Guillon. Um, Jaco is my um, uh, supervisor in Finland. And uh, so Guillaume, Anna, and Pablo were the, uh, the cell biologists we were working with. They were the ones that did the screen. So uh, here's a visualization of uh, some screening data. Each of the vertices represents a gene. And then so within the screen, um, there's some sort of measurement associated with each gene. You can score that and uh, calculate a p-value. Um, and the point of doing the screen is you're trying to look at uh, as many genes as possible, score as many genes as possible, and then find a subset of genes that are going to be the most uh, fruitful for uh, follow-up analysis. And generally, that's just um, taking the genes with uh, the lowest p-value or the, the darkest blue uh, vertices here. Um, so we're going to do some network-based stuff. Um, in our applications, the network data comes from, uh, well, it's, it's PPI uh, data, so it's protein-protein interaction data. Um, it just means that, so there's an edge between uh, two vertices if uh, the genes have proteins that interact. Then if we uh, rearrange the network here, so vertices are closer to vertices they're more connected to now. Um, so you can see down here that there is, that's better, um, there's a cluster of genes here. Uh, that's kind of just apparent in the network uh, itself. But so a lot of these genes actually have quite low p-values. Uh, not all of them do. Um, and then there's also low p-value genes elsewhere in the network. But our motivation is that we're, we're most interested in such clusters. So um, the groups of connected hits. Uh, so in the literature, uh, like a key term is guilt by association. And that was uh, discussed in the last uh, in the last talk. For our particular applications, it's to do with um, uh, genes that are functionally related, uh, and then that helps not only in the interpretation of the screen, but um, uh, also with the downstream analysis. So the aim is to determine a network-based hit list. Let's go from something like this to something like this. Um, so now all of these genes here are some kind of shade of blue. They're in our, our hit list. Um, and you can think of this as kind of like a smoothing um, of, the, uh, of the scores in the network. And we'll come back to that. So uh, there's a whole bunch of other methods that aim to do the same thing, quite different um, approaches. So I'm going to talk you through this Markov Random Field MRF approach, um, and then two particular, uh, oh, two particular uh, advantages um, of our approach, in particular to do with um, multiple hit labels. So we have two sets of random variables. Um, what we observe is Z. Um, usually it's a p-value, but we just call it Z. And then um, what we want to infer are these hidden labels, whether the gene is a hit or not. Um, and so I've got a toy example where here's a toy graph. Uh, you've got true labels, blue and red, and then you've got some sort of clustering in the graph. Um, so what we observe is uh, if you're true blue, some sort of realization associated with the blue density. If you're true red, some sort of as, uh, associated with the red density. And then the task is given our observed data, we want to infer uh, those underlying labels. So yeah, the mark of random field, so it's, you've got this, uh, this energy function or this cost function, and we're looking to find the minimum cost labels or the minimum energy labels. So for any labeling, you've got a unary term and this pairwise term. And we're just going to have that uh, the unary cost for giving xi label L is going to be this negative log likelihood of uh, observing your, your zi under uh, the density for L. So. Uh, our two labels here are blue or red, so pi L is either the blue or the red density. And then so if your ZI is more likely to have come from, or it has a distribution with the, the blue density, then um, it's going to cost you less. Oof. I wouldn't want to do that. What is this? OK, I'm not a Windows guy. All right, so. Um, OK, the pairwise uh, cost, so between any uh, connected pair. Basically, if you give xi label L, xj label K, that costs you something if L and K are different. So this is how uh, the network um, is incorporated into uh, the labeling. And this is also how you get this smoothness in the labeling, right? So neighboring nodes should have the same, um, should have the same label if they're 
uh, if they're next to each other. So everything here is set up, um, just this uh, value of beta, which is like a smoothness parameter. Um, so the first thing to know about beta is that it's, it's bounded. Um, if this is a table of our minimum energy labels, so for each vertex, we've got the rows here, 1 to 20, and then we've got different values of beta, Starting at, um, so beta equals zero, there's no, um, there's no network involved uh, in the labeling at all. The nodes are just, it's just based on their observed value, right? Um, as we increase beta, we get an increasingly smooth labeling um, because the cost of having different labels increases until you get to this like pathologically smooth labeling where everything's given the same label. Um, so you can keep increasing beta, but you won't change your label. So that's, beta's bounded in that way. Um, and so, yeah, beta around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, so that with the true labels, um, this isn't too bad either, but we don't know that in practice. So what we do is we use all of the values of beta and define this score to be uh, the proportion of time that the node is uh, given that label uh, by the, well, node or vertex degree. Um, so this allows us, we don't have to set the value of beta, and then also um, we actually get uh, a score that rather than just are you blue or red, it's to what extent you're blue or red. So you can see that in particular on this side with the four and six, uh, three, five, and seven are not as strong red. It's because they were actually a little bit on the red side and then four or six were very strong blue just from their observed values. Um, so yeah, like I said, the major advantages, we're looking at multivariate scores and then also multiple hit classes. Um, and so we're going to look at this data that was originally analyzed uh, with this Bionet method. So we've got our set of genes, we've got our network, and then we're going to look at enrichment of this particular pathway, um, as the people uh, in, this, in this paper did. So in this case, each gene has two p-values. So I'll just call it S p-value, T p-value. Um, hopefully the colors are quite nice. I don't know here, but this is a scatter plot of, uh, so the p-values for each gene. And the color bar corresponds to um, some sort of combined p-value. So this was something that was also um, uh, presented along with the Bionet method, a way to go from multivariate p-values to a univariate p-value. Um, and it doesn't matter how they did that, but the, the point here is that in order for the combined p-value to be low, both of the S and T p-values need to be low. If one of them is high, it doesn't matter how low your other one is, your combined p-value is high, right? So Bionet, or the people doing Bionet, they, they took the combined p-value, they threw it through Bionet, um, they've got their hit list, so there's 46 genes, and yeah, like I said, they were looking at the particular enrichment of, um, of this NF-kappa-B um, uh, annotation. So that was a measure of them saying, okay, that's, that's some good stuff. Um, so we're going to consider the data as, well, it's bivariate. That's, so there you go. Um, we have two dimensions, S um, and T, and then we're interested in whether, yeah, the gene is a hit in, in either dimension. I mean, it could be that, yeah, you have a low p-value in both dimensions, so we're going to call that S and T hits, but it's totally possible that you have a low p-value just in one, uh, and vice versa, and then, of course, you can be a non-hit in both dimensions as well. So means we've got multiple um, hit labels here. And so when we compare to uh, the hit list, so this is like more of a visual thing. Don't necessarily try to read the, the gene names. So this is the Bionet hit list though. So this was 46 genes. And then, so here's a hit list corresponding to S and T hits. Um, but we have two other hit labels. And so we have two other hit lists. Um, the intersection of these lists you can see that there's some here. Um, so Bionet was the combined p-values, the S uh, and T p-values were going to be low, so that corresponds to S and T hits. There's, there's intersection there. Um, these three don't intersect pretty much by definition, and so these not intersecting Bionet also makes sense. Um, if we look at where uh, these annotations are, so there was some uh, in Bionet, and we also found some with uh, the S and T hits. So we'll look at a Venn diagram in a second, because that, you know, how does that relate to the, to the intersection? Um, and then what was particularly interesting was, so we didn't actually find any um, 
of this NF kappa B annotation when you're just looking at S hits only, which is interesting because then if you look at T hits only, you find uh, a bunch more. Um, so here is just a Venn diagram where, so these are the same hit list. So this is the same information. We've got Bionet, S and T hits. So you can see that enrichment um, is in the intersection uh, of those hit lists. So this next slide, so this is, the, um, uh, this is the figure from the paper. I've just added a bunch more stuff to the Venn diagram. But the actual conclusion is I've already told you this. So it's that we found uh, the same NF kappa B enrichment for, uh, as, as Bionet did, with that hit label that corresponded to what Bionet was doing. Um, but because we were looking at the data as bivariate, we also had these two extra hit lists where in one we didn't find any enrichment and we found a bunch more enrichment um, in the other. Uh, so yeah, that really was just demonstrating uh, these advantages where we have the multivariate scores, but in particular how this relates to you can define multiple hit lists. So. Yeah, thank you, Trouble Funding um, from ECCB and then Dorical University Foundation. Um, I've got a poster, I'll be there. Thank you very, very much for listening. <laughs> Two questions. So I can take questions if you have any questions. Oh, okay. yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, okay, so this was just to do with, um, uh, so the definition of the score includes uh, the vertex degree. So what we uh, found was, um, okay, well, why do you have the vertex degree there? Um, and what we found was in these kind of networks, you have um, what are known as leaf nodes. You've got two examples here, one and 20, and they would often be, uh, if you're going to use this uh, kind of, you know, how long are you in a label, they would often keep that label just because they weren't connected to anything else. And so they would be the ones that, okay, that's the most interesting. Uh, yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, there's tons of heuristic in here. I made a bunch of decisions. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.